Good old sir, coming in Adam, and in another friggin' video, welcome to yet another exciting video, in this case part 4 of my Star Trek TOS timeline series of videos. In this video, I'll be covering the period from 2228 AD to 2264 AD, which covers the timeline from Kirk's birth to the beginning of his five-year mission in 2264. To assist viewers to verify if my timeline interpretation is correct, I provide information which can allow viewers to identify the episode the critical information is contained in. A full description of this information is found in part one of this video series, but this key should be adequate. When Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek back in 1966, he had a vision which remained basically consistent over the following three years. The animated series and early movies retained this consistency in the most part. When The Next Generation was released in 1987, Gene's vision had changed and the past needed to change in order to be consistent with this new vision. This video series will look at the original vision of Star Trek. A surveyed ship, the SS Columbia, was exploring the region around the Talos star group 18 years ago. My best guess is this episode occurred in 2254, so the SS Columbia was lost in 2236 in the Talos star group. In the conscience of the king, we discovered that uh, there was a famine on Tarsus V, which occurred in 2240. Kirk was on the planet, and he must have been only 12 years old when this occurred. Now we move into guesswork territory. If my assumption of the expansion of the territories of the humans, Klingons and Romulans is correct, the Klingons and Romulans may have been in contact about 2240. A lot of assumptions are used in order to arrive at this point, and this is a low probability event. But something must have caused the Klingons and Romulans to not join together against the Federation. There is a later Next Generation episode which deals with this called Yesterday Enterprise and is set in the 24th century, where a Federation starship assists the Klingon outpost against the Romulans. However, this does not explain why they did not join forces in the 23rd century to attack the Federation. If my assumption is correct, it's logical to assume that when both empires came into contact with each other, they engaged in some form of skirmish war. This could have lasted many years or just a single year, but after both empires sized each other up, they may have gone into an uneasy truce. After all, they both knew if they engaged in an all-out war with each other, the Federation would probably benefit. My guess is that this event would, you know, this would have occurred when both empires' borders came into contact and before any minor war between the Klingons and Federation. 22 years prior to the current date, which was probably 2242, the Federations and Klingons fought a battle which was inconclusive. The battle seemed to be over a panel, planet, Sherman's planet. I assume this was not a major conflict as the planet was presumably uninhabited. This is the first reference of a Klingon, Federation Klingon conflict occurring. The first Constitution class starship is launched in 2244. There are 12 such ships built during this year and subsequent years. This seems to imply starships could expect to continue to serve for more than 25 years. Other ships are Intrepid, which is Vulcan crew, the Constellation, Excalibur, Lexington, Hood, Exeter, Potemkin, and Defiant. Including the Enterprise, this totals nine. I'm uncertain what the names of the other three starships are. The SS Enterprise is launched in 2245, which means that I'm guessing it was the second starship built. I have no idea what the first starship name was. There is a possibility the Klingons invaded Federation territory, as Kirk claimed in Errant of Mercy, the Klingons had invaded and killed Federation citizens. It's unlikely he was talking about the short-lived war in 2264, as the main fighting was occurring in neutral territory, so this must have occurred earlier. The conflict in 2244 did not involve inhabited planets, so it could not be this, although this could have been the trigger to start a Cold War between the Federation and Klingons, and several years later, the Klingons may have actually advanced into Federation territory, killing citizens. Now, I'm guessing there may have been a possible Federation Klingon war in 2245. Any invasion or war cannot have been major for a number of reasons. The first is, if the Federation was engaged in a major drawn-out conflict with the Klingons, the Romulans would have got involved. The second is that the Federation would have had a neutral zone between it and the Klingons, you know, as they did the Romulans, and as there was no such neutral zone, there couldn't have been a major war. The final reason is, if there was a major war, we would have heard about it in early episodes. The last is not really a reason, as the Klingons did not even exist until episode 26, but it can be used to explain why there is no mention of them prior to this point. 
If you want to look at a historical parallel, a good parallel could be the North Korea invasion of South Korea. A Klingon subject nation could have attacked a Federation member and both sides wanted to limit the scope of the war to this area. In this case, the Federation can say the Klingons invaded and killed Federation citizens. This would have triggered a Cold War or escalated, culminating in a hair-trigger situation. Using our Korea example, that war began in 1950 and in 1963 we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thus, it's possible by triggering a Cold War by this invasion, 20 years later the war could have been hot again over some other neutral planet. Thus, my guess of 2245. If the invasion occurred 40 years ago, people would have forgotten the original conflict and there would be less heat in any disputes. This is only a guess, and this minor war could have occurred any time after the Federation, you know, after the formation of the Federation. But I think this is the most likely scenario. And again, is a possible trigger for the... Um, I mean, the Federation would have probably had an idea that Klingons existed prior to this, which is why they started building their new class of starship. So it all kind of gels together. In the episode Who Whom Gods Destroy, we first discovered there was a Federation victory at Axanar against an unknown enemy, with Captain Garth commanding the Federation forces. Assuming Garth was 30, which is young but possible, and he is now 50, this may have occurred in 2246. There was a minor war between the Klingons and Federation in 20, 2242, and this may have lasted until 2245, so I assume this was part of that conflict. This war was a minor affair, involved allies on both sides, possibly similar to the modern Korean War. The result was a draw, which may be a good description of the Korean War and could be a good model for this specific Federation Klingon War. Also in the episode Whom's a God Destroyed, we learn the Federation discovered a new planet, Antos IV, which houses a peaceful, non-human civilization. This must have occurred after 2245. We don't hear much of this race after this point, and considering that Garth went completely crazy when he learnt the ability to shapeshift, I suspect that may have been a reason why this planet's probably not integrated with the Federation. In Court Martial, we discovered there was a Vulcanian expedition which Kirk may have been involved with. Could this be the expedition which makes first contact with the Vulcans? Absolutely not. The Vulcans and Earth were in contact well before this, as the existence of Spock proves. You know, the fact the Spock is half human indicates there must have been a lot of Earth Vulcan contact before the Vulcanian expedition. Most likely it was the first Earth expedition to Vulcan, but that the Vulcans had made contact with Earth before Spock was born it seems reasonable. The Vulcans were in close contact with Earth well before Spock was born to allow Spock's farmer to meet, father to meet an Earth woman and marry her. It's also likely the Vulcans were a foundational Federation member, which was founded prior, well prior to this date. I now believe the Vulcanian expedition had something to do with first contact with the Klingons, which may have occurred in 2240 or a few years after, perhaps forming a Titan military bond between Earth and Vulcan, and perhaps one result was the fully Vulcanian crewed starship. I think a more accurate description of this expedition is Vulcanian diplomatic expedition. In Journey to Babel, we discover Spock had a disagreement with Sarek, his father, 18 years ago, when Spock devoted himself to Starfleet. This would have been 2247. This was the same year of the Vulcanian expedition, which Kirk may have been part of. As Spock reported to Pike from 2254 onwards, it's possible he began his Starfleet study in 2247, which means he rose rapidly in rank. However, it's more likely his studies ended in 2247, giving him five years to gain the rank he assumed when he reported to Pike. In the Enterprise incident, we learn Spock has been a Starfleet officer for 18 years, which means he became one in 2248. An earlier source indicates this is 2247. This difference could be caused by the confusion around the current year of the episode in question. So it's either 2247 or 2248. In Shorely, we discover Kirk had a girlfriend called Ruth 15 years ago, which would have been 2249. In Charlie X, um, we discover Charlie was marooned on Thasis for 14 years. Now we come to more guesswork. My guess is Kirk entered the Academy when he was 21 in 2251 and graduated in three years and served on the Farragut under Garavik as an ensign, oh sorry, as a lieutenant, until the captain was killed in the same year, 2254. In the Menagerie, Spock states that he served under Pike for 11 years, 4 months, 5 days. If Spock was with the Enterprise when Kirk took over, then Spock served with Pike from 2252 to 2263. 
could have been between um, 2251 and 2262, and there was a gap of one year while the Enterprise was refitted. Both scenarios work quite reasonably well. Now, we know that Spock served with Pike for over 11 years, which means the missions, that's the uh, missions of the Enterprise, perhaps two five-year missions, started in 2251 and ended in 2262. This means the mission to Talos must have occurred in the first year of the first mission. We discover in the Menagerie, the Enterprise was the only Federation visit ship to visit Talos 4. The mission occurred 13 years ago, which makes no sense unless the Enterprise had a major refit, which took two years, which is possible. If we play around with the exact dates, there could have been a gap of about a year between missions, which explains why Kirk never met Pike. It's more likely this occurred in 2252. Kirk visit, visited uh, this unknown planet, which I call either a Garden of Eden or Apella, 13 years ago in 2252, which incidentally was the same year that um, Spock uh, ended up at Talos. This was the year after Spock started reporting to Pike and several years after the Volcaning expedition in 2247. Now, this does not come from the TOS episode. It comes from Memory Alpha, but it seems reasonable, although I had to modify some of the dates. Construction of the Nebula-class starship started between 2363 to 2367. The Farragut was a Nebula-class starship. Now, first point, this cannot be correct, and it almost certainly comes from a later revision of the timeline required by the next generation. Now, if we go back to the TOS, uh, and and if we assume the Farragut was the first Nebula-class starship built, then the latest it could have been commissioned was 2254. I personally feel this is um, far too late as well, and it was probably commissioned much earlier than this, but let's go with that. If the Constitution-class starship had a build rate of one per year, its building program would have lasted from 2244 to 2256. So this vessel, this class, could not be a replacement to the Constitution class and may have been a smaller class, perhaps heavy cruiser rather than the battleship. My guess is Kirk entered the Academy when he was 21 in 2251, graduated in three years and served on the Farragut under Garabek as a lieutenant until the captain was killed in the same year in 2254. Kirk served on the USS Farragut under Captain Garabek while on the ship Lieutenant Kirk encountered the gas creature in 2254 when he was 24 years old. Kirk was 34 when he became captain, possibly 2264 or possibly earlier. This means in 2254 he was 24 years old. It seems that Kirk graduated in three years, so if this incident occurred in the first year, he entered the academy when he was 21. I suspect he was younger, but let's stay with 21. In Obsession, it stated Kirk is a young officer. He joined the Farragut as a lieutenant. As a result, I feel that Kirk graduated in 2254. Now, in Obsession, uh, we know that uh, Kirk served on the Farragut under Captain Garavik and that he encountered the gas creature in 2254, which means he was 24 years old. Nearly half the crew and the captain were killed. Kirk was one of the few survivors. Kirk served under Cap- Captain Garavik. He was Kirk's commanding officer from the day he left the academy. In Obsession, Kirk is a lieutenant. In this side of paradise, we discover Spock met Leela on Earth six years prior, which would have been 2258. Spock probably was assigned to the Enterprise to serve under Pike during his five-year mission sometime during this year. Leela spends another two years on Earth before going to a colony planet. We discover in What a Little Girl's Made Of that XO3, a planet, was explored by Corby at least five years prior, if not more. Two more expeditions arrived in the five-year period but found nothing. As a result, um, Kirby probably explored it in 2259. Now, in Britain's Circus, we discover the Federation, or, or maybe the merchant element of the Federation, had survey ships, in this case the SS Beagle. We later learned the crew was not up to the same standards as full Federation officers. This does seem rather odd, but the script says so, so it must be true. The crew consists of 44 men, and the captain was Captain R.M. Merrick, who Kirk knew at the Academy. Merrick joined the merchant fleet because he failed the Federation. He was unable to join the Federation and must have ended up in the survey team part of the merchant fleet. So I'm assuming this survey ship is surveying for economic reasons. 
The Beagle was destroyed six years ago at Planet 4, Star System 892, which is 2259. It's also possible the Prime Directive may not have been in force at this point. Now, Planet 4, Star System 892, discovered in 2259, but not explored again until the Enterprise arrived six, six, six years later, had a Rome-like civilization on it. At this point in time, we know the Prime Directive was in force. This doesn't come from TOS, but according to Memory Alpha, DNAB5 joined the Federation in 2259. DNAB5 is the first is first mentioned by Mud in I Mud. It's unclear if this is an alien or human planet, but Memory Alpha compromises and states the planet is occupied by both species, which actually seems reasonable. I expect the original species were or peoples were primitive, allowing the humans to co-occupy the planet as well as colonize at least one other planet in the same system, Deneb 4. We now go into my analysis. Now, this is what I think represents the Federation and Romulan border in 2260. This is the top-down view. The yellow line, the yellow dotted line, represents the midpoint between the two empires. The Klingons are probably at the bottom between the Federation and the Romulans. In this side of paradise, we discover Omicron Cetai 3 is a Federation agricultural colony. The colony consists of 150 colonists, took one year to get to the colony, and arrived in 2261. As it turned out, the colony is bombarded by a deadly form of radiation, which makes it unsuitable as a colony. In Journey to Babel, we discover that Spock has not seen his parents for the last four years, or not visited his parents for the last four years, which means he must have last gone to Vulcan, at least to visit his parents in 2261. We do know that he went to Vulcan in that period uh, because he had to go to touch base with his fiancée. In Graham B is the first Federation planet affected by the alien single-cell creatures which occurred sometime before 2262. In Graham B is probably a very small Federation outpost colony designed to support the investigation of the three other civilizations destroyed by the same alien creatures. It was probably about 700 light years away from Earth and well outside Federation space. By 2262, the alien creatures had taken control and had sent the sole interstellar spacecraft to the closest Federation planet, which was Deneva. The mining planets may have been closer, but they probably lacked enough people to act as hosts. The spacecraft from Ingram B arrived in 2263 and began to infect the inhabitants of Deneva with a single-cell alien life form. The alien creatures achieved control of the entire planet in the following 12 months, but the arrival of the Enterprise stopped them dead. John Gill arrived on Ecos, possibly in 2263, possibly earlier, and because of his Nazi, because of him, the Nazi movement starts on Ecos. Zeon, another planet in the same system, had sent people to assist Ecos, but now find themselves persecuted. The technology of Zeon has now been taken by the people of the uh, of Ecos and used to create a space fleet to invade the Xeon planet. It's likely Pike was injured in the first year of the Kirk Enterprise mission, possibly 2264. The former captain of the Enterprise, Christopher Pike, had been badly injured in an accident on an old Class J starship. Clearly the starships have a class nomenclature and the Enterprise is a more current starship. The Enterprise is supposed to be a Constitution class, so the naming convention may have changed, or the Class J starship is a smaller, more numerous type, like modern destroyers. Harry Mudd had a Class J cargo ship, so there may be a link there somewhere. And so with a heavy heart, we come to the end of Part 4 of my Star Trek TOS timeline, in this case covering everything from 2228 to 2264. The episode scripts can be found using the URLs shown. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.